Hey guys, Dave from Nerdarchy, four nerds by nerds, hanging out with this nerd. Nerdark is Ted. So now we are going to delve back into Xanathar's Guide to Everything with the appendixes. We're going to be talking about shared D&D campaigns. Jump down the description below where you can sign up for Nerdarchy the newsletter, get weekly gaming tips, as well as learn how to game with us. Hey guys, delving back into Xanathar's Guide to Everything. If you haven't picked up your copy, there's a link in the description to Amazon to help support the channel. All right, so we're talking Appendix A, page 172, you know, shared campaigns and a couple other things. I was really excited when I saw the title of this appendix. And I was like, oh man, people always ask about how me and Ted share <laughs> our campaign and how do you share your campaigns with other GMs and what do you do? And I'm like, this is a great topic. People will want to know about this. And it's not what we thought at all. It is literally, how do you build your own Adventures League? <laughs> is kind of like this is. It, it goes into like how they build Adventure Leagues and things that they thought about uh, when they did it. It's useful. It's not bad. It just, it just wasn't what I was expecting. Right, so what, what I took away from this is if you are fortunate enough to have a gaming group that wants to game in the same world and have multiple DMs and not have multiple stories, this is what you can use. Okay, you could use it that way. But also, like, if it just so happens you want to set up a D&D &D club at a public location mm -hmm. where you never know who's going to show up and you don't want to use Adventures League, you want to do your own thing, this does outline how to do that. And I, and I feel like that's literally what they're telling you. Want to have Adventures League without having Adventures League? Here's how we did it, and here's why we used these different instances, and you might find that helpful and useful. And they're right, because one, if you have new players showing up every week and you don't even know who's going to DM maybe, it's helpful to have a story that starts and have a story that ends. If it's a continuation, you don't know if you're going to get the same players. It mucks with the story. With this, you don't even have to worry about it. Who's here today? Oh, you guys. All right, here's you're gonna, today's quest. You're going you're gonna to run. These people are going to play. And this is what's going on. You start them at the start of the game. You end the story by by the end of the session. They break it down into you should pick a, either a two-hour block or a four-hour block so that you are respectful of everyone's time so that when you sit down at the table, you know what you have signed up for. And also, like, reading some of this stuff, I'm like, I think I played D&D &D wrong. I'm not sure. Because they're like, okay, uh, adventure duration. And, like, here's the thing, like, three to four simple combat encounters or one or two complex encounters per hour. I'm like, wow. I don't even know what that means in relation to how we play the game. Well, maybe simple encounters are those things that... You kill a goblin, like, there's a goblin sitting on a, on a log, <laughs> minding his own business, you run up and stab him. <laughs> you know, you got, like, one or two rounds, and if you're talking about... You know, three players, combat could last 15 minutes. Yeah, they're talking about four or five players. And, like, I know our combats are usually over in three to five rounds. And I still feel like they take at least 30 minutes. I don't feel like we use overly complex encounters. Uh, I agree. I I don't know. I, I think maybe they're doing something that we don't do. May, I, I don't know. You, guys, comments, weigh in. What do you think? <laughs> what is your experience? And when I listen to other people online talk about when they play the game, and they go, wow, you guys can do a X amount of comments at this time, and they say, like, like it's quick. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. I think it's, like, average. <laughs> and, like, here I'm like, wow, this is the lightning combat. This is really fast. That's, like, everyone taking – it's, like, every combat ends in one or two rounds, I feel like. Wow. Looking at, like, when you're saying in an hour, you're getting three to four combats. Well, I did see, you know, a, a game where that actually happened, where the monster didn't even get a, get a chance to, to go, because literally the four, the four players killed it, and it rolled a two on its initiative. So, like, boom, 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 boom. Oh, sure, I've seen that happen, but, like, like this almost, to me, says, like, all the combats are gone that way. Because when I plan an adventure for three to, you know, three hours... I generally go so I can have about three encounters. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them, and maybe a social encounter. So two to three combat encounters and a social encounter. And I'm saying three hours, <laughs> you know, to do to do that. I don't know. I, I just well, found it interesting. You, you also, you're not counting exploration in there, and there's going to be some of that as well. 
Oh, yeah. I, I'm just imagining that there's exploration in here. So, oh, wait a minute. Let's get into that. Three or four scenes involving significant exploration or, or certain social, social interactions. interactions. Three or four role-playing or exploration and... Six scenes in two hours. Seems like a lot. It does. So one of the things that, you know, they got the cool sidebar on the code of conduct and it goes through things that they have. Uh, here's a, an example of some of the stuff that's in the AL, Adventure League. You know, use this as your guidelines. You know, as, as with any, any grouping, any table, you want to know what the rules are. And this is a way of, boom, it's posted, it's listed right here. Do this or get out. Yeah, it, it just makes sense. Uh, and it goes into like the way they handle rewards, character creation. It tells you why they do certain things, how starting equipment. And most of this is just all geared towards making sure the experience is consistent whenever you come to your event, your, your gameplay. Everyone has a consistent experience. Now, I found this interesting that perhaps eventually changed from when I actually you know played mm -hmm. because here they talk about you get gold ba you know when whenever you level up you get treasure points whenever you play based on the number of hours played not as a reward for completing the adventure and that was one of my gripes with adventure league is i played an adventure and there was like one or two magic items that were awarded for playing and there was literally no no way to say who got it. Okay, this GM signed off that I played this adventure. I take my character sheet. I take the sheet that he signed. If I was a dishonest person, well, that guy got the, bro the magic brooch. But what's to stop me from writing it on my character sheet to say that I... That I that I didn't get it. So technically, there was two magic items for everyone that was at, in that adventure. If you were dishonest. Yeah. Now, here it's saying that you accrue points based off of playing, and whatever GM is, is responsible then has a list of potential magic items and their trade-in values, and once you've accrued points, you can say, all right, I'll take that one. And you found it, and you're adventuring. Well, maybe that's what maybe they did change it. Maybe that was one of the things they found. Actually, we know quite a few like eventually experts we could probably just ask. But maybe they did change it for that reason, or maybe it's a change they plan on making. I don't know because look, I played. I think I played one or two adventure league games. I literally just played with a character and I was done, and I never looked back. So. Yeah. I have no idea what I could have or not have. I, you're a, more of like a Pokemon person than me, so so you're like, what did I get? Where do I put it? Where do I keep it? I'm like, ah, that guy doesn't exist anymore. Well, I mean, there there was that, but I mean, I was there for the experience. I wanted to, yeah. I wanted to take it all in, not only for my benefit, not that I was ever planning on taking that character to another adventure league game, but to know how it works, to know how it works, and to then be able to be you know, informative here. I was like, squirrel, <laughs> after the game was over. <laughs> All right, so, you know, it gets into, you know, as I said, you know, the ability to get magic items. There's point costs based on what tier you are. And the award system, they call it, like, checkpoints. And, like, these yeah. checkpoints are where you, where you get paid, whether it's an experience level or levels, as the case may be, or your treasure and your magic items and stuff. Buying and selling, you can get scrolls, you can get potions, and this is the the real kicker for me was anything that some you know somebody else had, be it their weapons, their armor. After the fight's over, it's junk. It's, it's junk. It's all damaged beyond repair. You don't pick up anything. You're like, I drowned that guy. What do you mean I can't <laughs> use his armor? <laughs> so like, oh, it, it clearly's got water loss, water <laughs> yeah. damage. Having years worth of playing D and D and managing that inventory list of okay you know we killed three goblins we'll take these swords and we'll take that shield and to me that's part of the game that's lost here and yeah. it, that that's a bit sad it is and i understand that but i also at the same time understand why they do it that way again it comes it, it comes back to anytime you do a franchise of anything you just want it to be consistent you want the same experience no matter where you go yeah and how it happens and and you know, let's face it, there there has been different iterations of Adventure League. They've called it different things of organized play. So I really do have to defer to these guys because they have way more experience with this than me. In, in a lot of cases, I, I may you know sit here and kind of like armchair quarterback, 
But this isn't one where I would do that because I just recognize the, the amount of experience and data they have to draw on compared to me just making assumptions and you know giving my opinions. Well, I I will I will agree. And having having the experience that these guys have, you know, you're 100 percent correct. To me, I've, I'm used to the home game. I don't I haven't gone and done those things. As as often as I said, I've got I've got one adventure league game under my belt. He's an expert um, now. No, expert. no, no, I'm not claiming that at all. <laughs> Move over, Mike Merles. Oh, Ted has got a game under his belt, and we're gonna rewrite how this is done. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I I like what they're doing here. They did solve the problem that that I presented. That like okay, well, I want people to be honest. I want people to to enjoy the game and be able to get. An even amount for it, and here we we see that in the years since I've played, that there is that there have been revisions or revising is being done. But with this, you get to see that, and that that makes me excited. Yeah, I mean they're always like flip flopping back and forth. But well, flip flop is not a good word. But they're always trying to balance experience, ex- the, the the experience that, that people get when they play. And satisfaction is what I feel like. So, and, and it's a tightrope act to try and get that right, so that, like you said, you don't have to worry about dishonest players mucking with things. And let's face it, you know, it happens. Especially now, you're talking about hundreds, thousands. I don't know how many people, maybe, maybe, maybe millions of you know playing Adventure League or whatever. So yeah, they're not all going to be shining examples of humanity. So yeah, and you want to want to be consistent, and you don't want people to feel like to feel like they're coming to the table, and there's one character that. You know, maybe the player isn't isn't as honest, so he's got like all the gear from like every adventure or whatever. So they do they do what they must to try and make it better for everybody. Right. And you know, it only takes one bad apple to ruin it for everybody as well. So, so there's a mix mix and match of that going on. So I guess that brings us to our next appendix, Appendix B. So this is 17 pages worth of character names you will never run out of a character character <laughs> name npc name a name you need and it's broken down humans or not humans and then different cultures and countries around the world and it's broken broken down by race broken down by culture broken down by sex so you want a female dragonborn there's, name there's no sex in this book gender no sorry <laughs> gender my apology folks this show is pg not really, <laughs> but it's a family show. So you know whether whether you want male, whether you want female, you know we got dwarf, we got elf. It just goes on and on. You know, like I said, Egyptian, 17. Chinese, Japanese, uh, Slavic. I think I saw Indian, Greek. So you you're definitely going to get a lot of choices, Polynesian. So you know, I think it's a useful resource. I don't know if it's one that I want it in this book, but I know other people really appreciate it. I mean. We could just Google a lot of those names. <laughs> well, to me, having this at the table, I, I I would much rather, you know, flip and point. Okay, I've got a name for this NPC. Yeah. Or if I'm prepping ahead of time, I can, I can look and find, oh, well, let me try and find something. So for me, it's really useful as a DM. I do the same thing, but I have a couple of printouts that I printed off the internet <laughs> of, like, dwarf names, halfling names. Well, now you've got it in your trusty Xanathar's Guide to Everything. That's true, but, you know, we could add 17 pages of something else. <laughs> more subclasses, more magic items, some monsters. I, I don't know, anything. Uh, prestige classes, which sadly are probably not coming back. I would have taken it. But, you know, all in all, you know, it's not a horrible thing. I think a lot of people find it useful. And, you know, the, the share campaign things, while it wasn't what I expected and thought it was going to be, I think a lot of people are also going to find that useful, and it does give some good ideas. And the fact that they're even, they're even willing to say, you know what, maybe you, don't, you want to have your own organized play and you don't want to do it eventually, here's a little, a little bit of help to do that. I really appreciate that, too. I do as well. So what do you guys think? You know, do you guys dive into the appendices? Go ahead and continue the conversation down in the comments below. While you're down there, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. You can check us out at nerdarchy.com. So until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.